Hey everyone, this is Brian from the Tennis IQ Podcast. Josh and I hope that you're enjoying the content and discussions that we put out week after week. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us to continue to produce quality episodes, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash tennis IQ podcast slash membership. Currently, we have two tiers of support, $3 per month and $7 per month. So again, our Patreon page is patreon.com slash tennis IQ podcast slash membership. Thank you so much. And now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Josh Berger. And I'm Brian Lomax. And our topic today is the psychology of doubles. And there were a couple reasons that this topic came to mind for the two of us, um, for me, based on some recent reading that I've been doing, covering the psychology of doubles, covering the idea of uh, togetherness in teams, it wasn't necessarily for doubles, but just togetherness for teams, um, as well as the fact that you know Josh and I have both coached college tennis in which doubles is an integral part of that. Um, a number of my clients are uh, adult doubles players, so many of them playing in doubles only leagues or uh, they participate on teams in which doubles is a, an important component. And there are certain challenges that go along with being a doubles player and participating more on really the team side of tennis than being a, a singles player. I think most of us come to the sport of tennis generally through a singles route at some point, whether we were kids or maybe not always, but there's a lot of me and I in tennis, and especially when we're learning the game, it tends to be more in isolation. We're working on our skills in isolation, so um, we're very used to talking about ourselves and worrying about ourselves and our and those types of things, and that can represent some challenges for players as they begin to move into doubles, which is uh, much more of a team sport. So what we wanted to do today is break up the conversation into two parts. One is look at individuals and how they can be the best doubles players they can be and some of the challenges that you'll face. And then begin to look at teams themselves, which I think is, would be good for uh, players who have a set partner, whether that's on your college team or your adult team or even a professional team. I want to talk about some of the key components and challenges of that. So, Josh, let's start off with the, the individual level. Um, and one of the reasons I, I thought this would be good is that many players uh, don't have set partners, and they may be in environments in which you are you know, sort of plugged in to play with this person, and then next week you're going to play with that person, or tomorrow you're playing with this person. And it can be very difficult to just gain the, the cohesion and chemistry necessary in a couple of minutes to uh, be successful. But I think if we can, as a, as a player, if we can bring certain attitudes and skills to the court, we can be someone who can almost fit in with anyone and be, um, you know, be a solid and effective partner. So when you think about that, what, what do you think are some of the, um, ideal qualities that we can bring to the court and attitudes so that we can be effective with almost any any doubles partner? So it's a good question. I mean, I think there are a few main areas that it's, it's critical to be strong in. I think having um, unconditional positive regard for, for our partners is, is really important, right? Understanding that they will make mistakes they will have days where they're not always playing their best. They may make decisions that we disagree with. Um, and to be able to still support them, still have their back despite all that, you know, whether that whether it's somebody that you just met five or 10 minutes before the match, or if it's somebody that you've played with for a long time, I think that's 
I think that's true in, in both cases. And as you mentioned, Brian, there are a number of situations, whether it's, you know, high school or college team where a coach might be switching up partners throughout the year, or it's, you know, a USTA league match where maybe somebody is sick or unavailable and somebody else jumps in to play doubles together. Or I remember, you know, from times in my junior career where, you know, maybe I would sign up for singles and I'd sign up for doubles. And I didn't necessarily have a partner and they would just pair me with somebody. And sometimes you only have those few minutes before a match. And, you know, I think there's a few key questions and I'll go back to, to your, to your question. Cause I think there's a, a couple other important qualities, but I think there's a, a few key questions that you and your partner can ask each other and, and can, should go over if you only have those few minutes starting with, you know, what side do you like to play? A lot of players play significantly better on the deuce side or the ad side. I know for, for myself, I play significantly better on the ad side for a couple different reasons. Um, in, in terms of returning, just in, ter- in terms of a number of things. Um, and a lot of players prefer one side or the other. Um, what hand do you play with? Are you a righty or are you a lefty? That, that's you know, a pretty fundamental question that you generally can't tell when you're meeting somebody. Um, But that's an important question that you want to know as you and your partner decide how to navigate playing together. Um, Who's going to serve first is another important question. How are we going to play as a team? Are we the type of team that likes to come in to net all the time and play, you know, as many points as possible from the net? Are we more the type of team that likes to, sort of ease our way into points a little bit where maybe there's a little bit of two back, you know, two back if we're returning a first serve, for instance. Um, So maybe there's a little bit of that. Um, So having some of these discussions in terms of, you know, how do we want to play? Who's serving first? What side are we returning from? You know, what, what hand do we play with? Some of these really basic questions um, I think are important to talk about right from the bat, you know, right, right from the start, right off the bat. Um, but to go back to your question, Brian, I think in addition to unconditional positive regard, um, I think there are some other important things. I think, you know, constant communication is really helpful, especially if you haven't played together much or at all. You know, I, I, I like to look for doubles teams that talk between just about every point. Um, you know, there, there should be some sort of communication, whether it's, um, you know, a high five whether it's talking be- be- before your team serves about, you know, where are we going to serve? What's our game plan here? Are we going to poach? Are we not going to poach? Um, and, and again, you know, that, that sort of thing, you know, do we like to poach? Do we want to do hand signals? Do we want to maybe play some other sorts of formations, whether it's I formation, whether it's Australian, you know, again, these are maybe the types of things that you, you may not see at every level of doubles, but still important to discuss can still be important tools and can add versatility and, and options into your game. Um, I think in addition to communication, I think there's, yeah, I I think, you know, you want to, both players want to feel like they have the other person's um, best interests in mind. So what does that mean? That means, you know, trying to make good decisions, trying to go for the right shots, trying to set each other up and not just playing individually. Um, Again, this is a team sport, you know, it's, we really want to be, hitting the types of shots and playing in a way where we're likely to set up our partner. So to me, you know, what that looks like is oftentimes, you know, if we're in a one up one back format where one player's, you know, at the baseline, one player's at the net, the baseline player generally looking to set up the net player, you know, looking to keep the ball cross court predominantly, not trying to take too many chances down the line, maybe at certain moments and trying to really look to set up, the net player whenever possible. Again, every team's a little bit different. Um, so those are a few key things that that come to mind, but I think it really comes down to, um, yeah, c- communication in that, that positive, you know, positive intent, by, you know, unconditional positive regard and, you know, looking to constantly play as a team. As, as you said, Brian, a lot of players, most players are introduced to tennis individually. So being able to transition to doubles and being able to use, your tools and your partner's tools in a cohesive way that that makes sense, um, where you're really complementing each other, and you know I, I think can be difficult. But you know it, w- what's important is both players are on the same page with that broader mission, and then with some of those smaller tools and tactics on on how they get there. 
Yeah, I, I, I like a lot of what you, you said there. And um, yeah, getting back to the, the positive regard, and, and I think that's, that is a key component of being a great team, is that you want to step out onto the court having your partners back, and, and you want to obviously feel that back from them, right? Um, the willingness to communicate. Uh, I think it's also important that when you first meet somebody, you know, again, if you're comfortable having this conversation, is also discuss what can I do for you when you're you know not playing your best, right? How can I support you? How can you support me in those instances? Knowing that the probably the one of the bigger sources of interference, not only in tennis but even especially in doubles, is your own concern with how you're playing to a certain extent, or how things that are happening on the court are affecting you. Um, so, you know, if you and I are playing together, Josh, there could be a situation in which you hit a double fault and how I process that is super important. Do I start to just worry that, oh man, Josh, he's blowing it, he's nervous, and I get a little bit in my own head about that, therefore I, I might make bad decisions or... Can I be, you know, helping you through the whole process, right? Hey, let's just keep going for it. No big deal. Next point type of thing. Um, the whole goal is obviously to win the match. And so everything that we're doing together out there has to be really in service of that. It has to be the willingness to put aside your ego for the, the benefit of the team. And that that kind of thing, right? So there's a lot of I think that covers can cover a lot of different things. It's, it's not about me. This is about us. How do we achieve that? And our own sort of thoughts and ego are tend to be sources of interference there. I think it also helps to come into a, a new team with being open minded. Meaning, let us not be so rigid about how we must play. So let's be open-minded with the, you know, the possibility of using different formations if we need to. Um, let's be open-minded about the level of communication um, that we need to have out here. I think if we get too rigid about certain things, um, then we become uh, easier to break. I think it's you know, that Bruce Lee quote about the, the strongest tree being you know, the willow or the bamboo because it's able to bend with the wind. But if we're rigid, we can more easily be broken. And so we want to make sure that we're not being rigid. We're open-minded. We're flexible in our approach. And again, it's more about the team. So we're thinking more about the we and the us in this situation more than the I and the me. Um, so I think those are just some general character skills that uh, players need to bring to any time they're plugging in. Um, when we're playing. And, and like you, you brought up a lot of specific situations. I think there are also, you know, what are some of the challenges? I know when we were talking off air, we were talking a little bit about worrying about perhaps disappointing your partner when you make a mistake. Uh, or if you're on a college team or some sort of adult team and you have teammates, you might be worried about disappointing them or what are other people thinking. So those can be challenges. Um, you know, what are some of the other challenges, Josh, or you can expound on that one um, that you've encountered? I mean, I think disappointing a partner is definitely a key one, a key one that I've heard from people that I've worked with. Um, it, it's even gotten to the point where I, I know somebody who has stopped playing doubles for a period of time because the pressure of doubles and of potentially disappointing a partner was was too much to handle, and and this person decided to focus on singles for the for the period of time. Um, so I think that is definitely a key one. And again, we're you know if if we come to tennis from a singles perspective, we're used to playing for ourselves, and if we play well, it's on us. If we don't play so well, it's on us. Good days, bad days, you know, it's everything rests on us. When we're playing doubles we're reliant on a partner and our, a partner is reliant on us. So it doesn't all rest on us in that same way. And I think 
that can add a lot of pressure. And, you know, just, just like in a singles match, we can start to think about, you know, in singles, we might think, you know, what if I um, get broken here? Or what if, you know, this happens? What if that happens? Or I think in doubles, we can, you know, our self-talk can also um, go in a number of different directions. What if, what is my partner going to think if I double fault here? What is my partner going to think if I miss this next return? Um, you know, I, I really don't want to disappoint them. Um, so I think, I think that is definitely a big one. Um, I've even heard people talking about not wanting to hit their partner with their serve, um, as a concern, as something maybe that, that holds them back. Um, so I think that's, that's another one. Um, you know, I think oftentimes people play doubles in team formats too, whether it's a USTA team, whether it's high school, college, um, so again, not wanting to hurt the team. And again, if, if, if these are the sorts of thoughts that we're having again, which are all very normal, natural thoughts, if you're thinking about not wanting to hit your partner, if you're thinking about not wanting to disappoint your partner, not wanting to miss this next shot, if you're having these sorts of thoughts, what are you not focused on? You're not focused on your game plan. You're not focused on your strategy. You're not focused on how you set up your partner. You know, you're, you're not focused on any of these things. You're not focused on being the best partner that you can be. You're focused on not making a mistake, not, you know, not screwing up, not disappointing somebody, not hitting somebody, right? You're, you're focused on all of the types of things that we generally suggest not to focus on, right? If you're telling yourself, don't do this. Don't do that. Um, you know, it's it's more. It's actually more likely to happen. It can become. It can definitely become a self fulfilling prophecy. I mean, I, you know, if, if if I were to 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 sort of change the subject for a second, if I were to say, all right, don't think about the number thirty. Just don't think about that number thirty at all. That you know, that three, that zero. You know, the the numbers on the football field. Just don't think about the number thirty at all. What are you going to think about? Thirty. What what else could you possibly think about? And I think it's the same way. If you're you know if you're telling yourself, don't screw up, don't hit your partner, don't disappoint your partner, uh, that's the same types of things can happen. You you become more likely to actually do that. That's where your focus lies in what you're trying to avoid. So instead, to try to give yourself a clear intention for what you're trying to achieve and what what is your goal here, right? Whether it's whether it's okay, this is where I'm trying to serve whether it's, you know, this is what I'm trying to do with my return so that it can get into the net, whatever it, that actually looks like logistically, um, trying to put your intention on, you know, what you're really trying to do. And that be where your self-talk and your thoughts lie as much as possible. Um, so I think going back to what you were saying, Brian, I think, you know, not just not wanting to disappoint our partners, not wanting to you know, cause the team to lose, I think is, is definitely, you know, a, a big part of it. Um, I think a lot of people have certain maybe insecurities about their own game, um, whether it's their volleys, whether it's serve or return, ground strokes, you know, wh whatever it may be. And I think sometimes those can be amplified in, in a double setting and maybe, you know, become more of a vulnerability. So I think that sort of insecurity or worry about, maybe perceived weaknesses in people's games can lead to, you know, hesitancy or not people not wanting to go for their shots, not playing aggressively, not playing to win, but trying to more so avoid, avoid losing. I think that it's a great topic because um, let's say you are working with and or coaching a player who has those types of thoughts, those avoidance type of thoughts. There's probably a lot of work that needs to be done off the court in order to help that player begin to develop more of an approach attitude, meaning uh, when we talk about avoidance versus approach, approach meaning what do we actually want to happen? What do we, and therefore, what do we need to do to, in order to make that happen? Um, we often say it's very hard to do a don't. So I don't, you know, I don't want to disappoint my partner. That doesn't really tell me what to do. It gives me maybe a number of things I don't want to do. But it doesn't tell you what to do, and so there can be some work on on understanding that um, that goes on off the court. Try to develop more of a um, thinking about what it is I want today. What do I want to do, etc. Um, I think sometimes a result of players not wanting to disappoint their partners or teammates is apologizing on the court, 
And I will often get asked that question, uh, you know, what do you think about saying sorry? And um, it's very natural. We, like you said, Josh, we don't want to let our partner down. We care and so forth. And um, we didn't mean to make that mistake, obviously. And we just were, um, you know, we're maybe even processing that point as being more important than it is, or that mistake being more important than it is, because as we've said yeah, many, many times on this show, the points are not as important as we think they are, right? They're just a means to an end. Um, so I think, you know, when, I, when I'm asked that question about apologizing, it's not as if we go out into the court intending to make mistakes, you know, if we're partners and, and 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 you make a mistake, I'm not upset. If I make a mistake, um, we're both trying to do the right thing. And we both have enough of a sense of how tennis works to know that it's not always going to work. There will be mistakes. It's just how it is. Um, so I think the more that the partnership can bring a good perspective to the idea of mistakes, and as long as they're within the framework of our game plan, and we're trying to execute good shots, then I don't have a problem with a partner making an error um, because I trust my partner is trying to help us, you know, do everything we can to win the match. So, I, I you know, for me, an apology is not necessary. Um, and I also have to apply that to myself because I know me, sometimes I do apologize too much when I'm out there. So I think realize that we're, we're both interested in winning the match and we're not intending to make mistakes, but mistakes are natural and normal. And the sooner we get through it and on to the next point, the better. You brought up an interesting point about how sometimes doubles can expose a weakness. Now, when we talk about singles players, we often mention our mantra of you know um, maximizing your strengths and managing your weaknesses. And you want to manage your weaknesses to the point that they don't get in the way of using your strengths. Now, we have to think about that same way as a team here. Part of our conversation together should be around what are my strengths as a player and what are yours? And then how do we fit that into a cohesive unit so that um, we're also able to hide any particular weaknesses? So, you know, for some reason, let's say my backhand volley is a weakness. You know, when it comes there, right, we need to figure out ways that minimize exposure to that. So, you know, what are some formations that we can do? Maybe if, if my overhead is a weakness, I'm not really confident in that. We need to figure out how we're going to manage that so that there's not a, you know, some sort of miscommunication going on and I'm not in a position where I have to hit a lot of overheads, right? So... Uh, understanding what our strengths and weaknesses are and then coming up with the right cohesive strategy to minimize the exposure of our weaknesses and maximize that we're using our strengths there. Then I think it can at least help um, deal with possible lack of confidence in certain shots and, and, and being broken down in that way. So I think you know those are some interesting pieces to, to consider are you the type of person who says sorry a lot or apologizes a lot? How can we change that perspective? Are you the type of person who does think more about what he or she doesn't want to happen, whether it's with respect to disappointing your partner or just with avoiding mistakes and those types of things? And can you do some work off the court to help you really focus more on what it is that we do want? You know, I would say default human thinking tends to go more on the avoided side, more as part of our survival instinct. You know, we're avoiding danger. We're avoiding unpleasant emotions, we're trying to avoid stress. But the tennis court is not life or death. And if anything, it's really an environment to help train you to be a tougher person. So you're, you're intentionally putting yourself, voluntarily putting yourself in situations in which there will be adversity. So the whole idea isn't to, to avoid these things. The whole idea is to embrace these things as lessons to make us tougher. Um, you know, and so the more that we can get that kind of approach attitude and this is all a training um, kind of attitude, then I think the more successful we can be in tennis overall, but certainly as a doubles team.
Definitely, definitely. And I think being able to embrace whatever happens out there, the ups, the, the downs, as as normal as, you know, a part of, you know, a, a part of what happens in a tennis match, a part of what it means to be a tennis player. Your partner will double fault. How are you going to handle it? Do you have a plan for how you're going to handle it when that happens? Your partner will make mistakes. Your partner will go for shots and make decisions sometimes that, you disagree with that you think was the wrong shot to go for. So I think having a plan for how you want to handle those situations and all, and being able to embrace, you know, situations as they, as they come as, you know, this is part of the learning process. I'm trying to learn individually. I'm trying to learn, we're trying to learn as a team here. Um, and, you know, but I, I think what's important is to, well, I think, it's important to be able to do that in the moment and also afterwards to be able to reflect, you know, have a conversation with your partner, talk about, you know, how, how it all went out there, especially if you're going to continue playing together and try to learn from, from each experience, right. Doing something like, you know, some of the reflection exercises we've talked about, like a, you know, a three, two, one or something like that. What, what went well, what, you know, what didn't go so well that we want to improve upon, you know, what did we learn doing, being able to do something like that as a team can be really powerful in terms of being able to, you know, really I- identify what happened out there, both the, the good, the bad, and, you know, and maybe we don't want to think of it that way, but what, what went, what, what went well, what maybe didn't and, and what, you know, how we want to learn, how we want to move forward from here. And, and then, you know, a- again, if, if people are going to be playing together, being able to in the future, being able to apply that going forward and not, you know, I, I think a lot of players have the tendency to continue making the same mistakes over and over again. And I think that's very normal in different areas of life. But I think a way that we can hopefully avoid that or move past that is to really examine what's happening and and try to learn from it, try to, you know, not continue making the same mistakes over and over again and instead, you know, be able to apply our learnings and apply, you know, what we pick up from really examining and taking a look at our performances and and then really think about how yeah, how how we can use this going forward. Yeah. And I think now maybe we can transition into the the doubles team itself because you you were kind of mentioning the idea of uh, you know, post-match reflection and and that's certainly helpful for teams that work together on a regular basis, whether that, again, regardless of the situation, adult league, professional, college, um, I think there are certain elements of the team that really can be quite helpful. Um, Recently read a book called uh, Togetherness by Matt Stoller, Um, and it's all, all about teams and organizations in sport and how they can excel doesn't necessarily address the specific context that we're talking about today of a two-person team, but you know, in reading the book, there there's a lot of content in there that that would apply, um, and we can kind of go over some of that as we have have this conversation. But I think the more that a doubles pairing can look at itself as a team, almost an organization, you know, maybe and you bring in your coach here. Um, whether it's you know your, your college coach, your adult league coach, or perhaps as a professional team, you have a, a coach that is working with you, right? You have a you basically have an organization, and we want to understand what's the best way for that to work together. And you know, in this book, the whole idea is that teams that are more together, more cohesive, um, win more than teams that that don't. And I think you can see this in doubles when, even during a match, to me, the level of communication between partners is somewhat of an indication of the level of togetherness at any given moment. Um, you know, when we were talking earlier about a, a college match I had observed last year and how um, at a crucial moment, one of the teams, their, their togetherness kind of fractured. It was late. It was five all, and something happened out there, and they they stopped communicating. They stopped supporting each other, and and they all 
went internal. One player was worried about what the other one was thinking. The other one was so egocentric, was upset with his partner, um, and then just decided to try to do everything on his own. And uh, it was at a crucial time at five all in the set, and uh, they didn't win the, the set. They lost 7-5. They lost those two games. And even after the match, there was that the fracture didn't heal. Um, you know, this is a team that probably could have used a lot more work in how to communicate and be a great team beforehand. But sometimes when you're successful and you're winning a lot, you don't pay attention to that work. And when they needed the trust in each other, when they needed the togetherness as a team, in, in probably the most important moment of their season, they didn't have it. And I think that's not something we would like you know, people to have as a story. We would like people to not have to tell that story. Although maybe you need to tell that story in order to learn from it and be better the next time. So um, when you think of doubles teams, Josh, the, maybe the ones that are successful or, or you can even start with the challenges to all of this, uh, what comes to mind for you? I think having a a general plan of about how they want to play as a team, you know, being on the same page about that is is really important. Um, being able to play as a team, being able to um, yeah have have each other's backs. I think a lot of the the same types of things that we talked about in the the first portion of the conversation, where we were talking about sort of how we be the best teammates that we can possibly be. I think it's really important, you know, that the teams embody these, these qualities as well. Um, I think, you know, oftentimes it looks like um, maybe two players that have different strengths. So maybe one player is, you know, has great serves and the other player is really strong at the net. And, and that, pairing, you know, allows for, especially when that one player is serving, um, you know, relatively easy or more reliable holds because one player is setting up the other player and then the other player is finishing points. So I think, you know, it can look like that in terms of playing styles really gelling together well. Um, so I think that's a piece of it, but I think a big piece of it, and I think this this relates to what you're saying with your point about the, the college tennis story, is you know, it, it's very easy to have each other's backs when the team is up. When things are going well, it's 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 very easy. When what's most important and what's what's really most critical for the success and the longevity of a doubles team is to be able to have each other's backs when things aren't going well. When maybe one player is going through a slump. When maybe you know there's a day where on that big point somebody double faults or somebody misses a big shot or their decision-making maybe wasn't what you would have chosen. Um, so I think successful doubles teams have each other's backs, especially in those key moments. Um, I th that, that's, you know, I, I think some of those qualities are, you know, I, th I think those are some of the most important qualities when I think of the, you know, teams that are, that are ultimately successful. Yeah. And I think, um, one thing, let's say you and I were a team, some work that we could do, right, and we're going to take this very professionally, is to understand um, you know, what are the values and behaviors that as a team, you know, we want to represent and that we want to um, act on out there. And maybe we even have uh, an identity as a team. So maybe our identity is like, you know, we're a hardworking, intense team that um, is really tough to beat. Something like that. Well, it could be whatever, right? That we want to have that. And then, okay, if that's our the vision of who we are, if that's our an identity that we want to aspire to be, there, then what are the values that go into that? Um, and that could be, you know, maybe being prepared all the time, resilient, great communicators. So there could be a number of values that we would want to have a, a conversation about. And then we take it down to the next level. Okay, so for each value, what does that mean? What, what are the behaviors that go into being that? Um, so, you know, great communicator, obviously, is, you know, all right, we're going to have a plan for every point. We're going to be doing it with signals and or we're going to talk after each point. 
maybe if it's positive, okay, each, no matter what, we're, you know, we're coming together, um, slapping hands or whatever, touching rackets, however you do that. And so for each of the, the values that we have, or virtues even, we, we turn that into specific behaviors. Now we have a better sense of how we need to be on the court in order for us to realize that vision. And so I think that is, even though that sounds like maybe we're going really the extra mile here, but why, why wouldn't we? If we want to be a great team and we want to really feel together out there, we have to be unified about what is the, the vision or identity that we want to be together. And this kind of work can really help go from I, me to we, us, which is where we need to be out there. And the more that we you know, discuss that, that identity, those virtues and values, those behaviors, the closer we become to doing that. The more that we go out on the practice court and we understand how we work together. We're not just working on Josh's game and Brian's game. We're working on our game. Develop, we've often talked about developing clarity in your own game. Here, we need to develop a lot of clarity about how we play doubles and what we do. Um, you know, they, for obvious reasons, the Bryan brothers were very good at this because they're twins and they have known each other a really long time and there's just some things that are super intuitive and instinctual for them. Um, but, you know, as to players who are not twins, you know, can we somehow begin to create more of that? The more togetherness that we create, the more that we're working on our game and developing clarity about how we play and how we impose our game on others is, I think, is, is paramount to becoming uh, a successful team and that no matter what happens out there, um, we need to follow our, our virtues and values and behaviors. So in that situation, I told the college team, you know, if they had had something like this, they would have used it in those tough moments. Cause like, like you said, this stuff is easy to do when things are going well, it's necessary to do when they're not right. That's when, you have to strictly go to your process and protocols to get you through. Um, it's a stress moment in a match. And how you respond to that stress moment is important. So do we want to fracture and protect our own self-esteem? Or do we want to have the courage to come together and really put ourselves out on the line and go for what we're trying to do here? And, and put our egos aside and be one, one unit, be a we, be a us. Um, hard to do, but if you if you're willing to put in that kind of work, then you can begin to build the, the kind of trust and confidence and togetherness that you're going to need to be a, a successful partnership. Totally, totally. I mean, yeah, b being a we focusing on uh, the team and, and putting that first rather than my needs and their needs, my partner's needs is is key. What does our team need right now? Right, if it's a changeover. And we're down four or five and our, our opponents are about to serve for the set. What do we need to do right now? It's not about what do I need to do and what does my partner need to do? We need to be on the same page about what we as a team need to do. What is our game plan here? I've seen successful teams who play all sorts of different ways, whether that's okay. We need to try to really go for our returns here because we've been too passive with them and the net player is just, taking advantage of that or we need to just get into the point more we've been missing too many returns and therefore we need to just be able to neutralize that first serve return get it back into play cross court and get into the point and once we're in the point we have a pretty good success rate um or maybe we're incorporating some other tactics whether it's the lob return and trying to lob over the net player's head and trying to come in behind it or whatever the, the specific tactics look like trying to be on the same page and putting the team first and the team's needs first and having a team strategy is, is really key rather than just thinking rather than it being two individuals playing singles together on the same side of the net. Yeah. Cause that, that never works. Right. I mean, it, I suppose it could work if the other team is also doing the same thing. Um, right. But if, if we're talking about longevity and being a great team, there has to be that, that togetherness and that understanding. And of course, there are a lot of challenges 
to this, um, you know, many of which we've we've really brought up already. Um, and then, you know, maybe it's just the, the amount of time that you have to put into the creation of the team, depending on your, your circumstances. I, you know, I work with a number of uh, adult league players who do have regular partners, but it's not typical for them to have the kinds of conversations that we're talking about. They, you know, when they're not on the court, they're maybe talking about other aspects of their lives. Um, when they are on the court, um, you know, just in, in my own conversations with these players, there's still a lot of what's going on with me out there, or I'm worried about my partner kind of thing out there, and there's not as much of it being spoken out loud to each other. Um, so I think a lot of this is if you really want to be a great team, regardless of your level or whatever league that you're playing in, you've got to be willing to be vulnerable and have these conversations with each other and to, to put some importance on that as a means of playing better tennis together. Um, I don't think really anything bad comes of that other than, you know, you're putting yourself out on the line to having the, having to have the courage to discuss these things. Um, but the good news is very few of the people you play against would be willing to do that. So you're going to have an advantage over others just through the fact that you were willing to communicate with your partner and build something bigger and, and important. You know, we often perform better when we're playing for something that's a little bit bigger than ourselves. And, um, you know, if we can be in a way kind of subservient to the team aspect, we can do that. Um, it gives us a little bit more purpose out there for our team or rather than just me and what I'm working on. Um, so I think there are a lot of challenges to being a great team like this because, um, quite frankly, even as tennis coaches, we don't always train it as a team sport. Kind of do, but we don't put it it would be different if we were talking to like, you know, uh, an American football team or a soccer team or a hockey team, you know, where, where there's much more interplay between the players and there are more players. And we, we really focus on the necessity of doing your job and, and that kind of thing, um, where I think we could probably in the tennis world pay more attention to doubles being a true team sport. And, and dedicating uh, more coaching to that um, and, and even perhaps learning more from other team sports about how they create cohesion and chemistry and togetherness so that we could have stronger partnerships. Definitely. And I think there's a lot that can be learned from other sports. I mean, we, we recently had an episode on tennis as a fighting sport or tennis as a combat sport um, where we talked about the book, the fighter's mind. And we talked, you know, about how in that book, they, they showcase a number of different combat sports and, and the, and their, you know, and the athletes of their, that's those sports and, and their mentalities. And I think, especially as we think about doubles, especially if, if you, you know, play more doubles than singles. And I think especially, you know, the other thing to, to know here is that many, many adults, especially as people, you know, move past, you know, their twenties or thirties, you know, as many adults tend to play more doubles than singles. And I think there's, there's different reasons here, right? Um, court time, court availability is one reason. Um, a lot of people like the social aspect of doubles, you know, there's, there's less movement, um, you know, I think there's, there's a number of different reasons, um, but being able to learn from other, other sports, other athletes, um, you know, many tennis players have experience playing other sports, maybe playing a team sport, maybe they're a dual sport athlete, or maybe they've played something else in the past. So being able to learn from their own experiences and also being able to learn from the experiences of other people, professional athletes, um, you know, other other high level athletes of other sports, and learn what makes them, you know, great teammates, great leaders, and how we can, you know, how individually and as a team, you can incorporate those things into your own game. And I think you could even bring in aspects of leadership into that. One of the models of leadership that I have talked to uh, 
team captain is about is uh, you know the model of transformational leadership, which is really uh, you know, leading by example, uh, doing your best to motivate your team, your partner, um, you know, showing your partner that you really care, and then being willing to have you know intellectual conversations about tennis or your sport, um, and so you know having even just a little bit of a study of that can certainly help the team be be more effective. Um, and, and as we've probably said in maybe other episodes um, or just even in other conversations, uh, you don't need a title to be a leader out there. And and sometimes one player tends to be a little bit more of the the planner, the quarterback, the leader, the captain of it than, than the other. And that's fine. Um, but that's a good thing to know as well is, you know, Again, in terms of doing our own our own job, uh, but I think there's a lot of cool stuff about doubles and how we could even be better teams going forward. So, any last thoughts, Josh? No, I mean, I think I think we we've covered a lot here. I think you know, a big piece is being able to be accountable. Um, you know, I think when I think about teams that that don't work well, don't play well, don't last, there's a lot of finger pointing. A lot of times people are pointing fingers at each other, you know, blaming losses on their partners, um, you know, not taking accountability for their own game and, and, and the result, right? If, if you win, you win as a team. If you lose, you lose as a team. You know, in reality, are there days that one player plays better than the other? Sure. Are there, you know, moments where, you know, where somebody could have done more in, in certain moments? Sure. Um, but you know, I think each player and the team as a whole taking accountability for results, for performance, for continuing to get better, you know, every time you're out there is really critical to, um, to, to playing the best doubles you can play and being the best doubles player and best doubles team that, that you can be. Well, I think that's a great wrap to, uh, to the conversation. So thanks, Josh. Um, And thanks, everyone, for listening. For more on today's episode, you can check out the show notes. If you have any feedback or questions for me and Josh, please email us at TennisIQPodcast at gmail.com. You can also use the Twitter hashtag TennisIQ. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, including YouTube, so you can be notified of new episodes. You can also check us out on Instagram. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash tennis IQ slash membership. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon in our next episode.